Psalm 126. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. You've probably seen advertised, and you may actually have done yourself, one of those really crazy, sort of cross-country, really muddy obstacle course races where you think, okay, you run 10 kilometers, but in the course of it, you climb over some uh, obstacles, you dive through the mud, you crawl through the tunnels, and it looks like, on the promo video at least, it looks like a, a, a lot of fun. And you, so you think, well, that, that really is something I'd like to do. So you sign up, and you do a bit of training, and the day comes, everyone's there, it's fantastic, and you start. About five kilometers in, you're beginning to think, why in the world did I sign up for this? You've got a stitch in your side, you're covered in mud, it's raining, you're cold, and you just want to be out of there. So you could drop out. It's okay to drop out of that, isn't it? The Christian life is like one of those assault courses. It's not a sprint, it's up and down, it's cross country, you will get muddy. What do you lose if you drop out? Romans chapter 2, there's this wonderful phrase, those who by patient continuance in doing good, they seek for glory, honour and immortality. If we drop out of this race, what do we lose? We lose glory, honour, and immortality. It says of Moses, Moses chose rather to suffer affliction, this is in Hebrews 11, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Why? Because he esteemed, he thought, that the reproach, the reviling, the hardship because of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, because he looked to the reward. It says that in Hebrews 11. What's the connection with Psalm 126? In Psalm 126, we have those two stages of that race. Verses 1 to 3, it's wonderful. It's a great time. And then, suddenly, in verse 4, we're in a completely different territory. Suddenly, things are not so good. Suddenly, things are really hard. But this psalm gives us one other thing as well. It gives us verses 5 and 6. It gives us a third reality of the Christian life. What is that? There is a harvest coming. There is joy sown for the righteous. So this evening, I want to look at three certainties of the Christian life. This psalm gives us three certainties. That means things that if you follow Christ, you will experience them. There is no avoiding them. This is the way that Jesus went for us, and it's the way that he has marked out for us. Well, number one is verses one to three, and it's this certainty. The certainty of past deliverance. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. Then our mouth filled with laughter, our tongue was singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us. Whereof we are glad. What is he talking about? He's talking about some point in Israel's history. It could be the time when they were sent into exile, sent into captivity, and they were brought back again. Now, it may not be that time, it could be some other time, but the key here is that there is a situation which was bad, which was hard, where they were helpless. And what did God do? He shed his marvellous light. That is basic to your identity and my identity as a Christian. What happened in this psalm is what God has always done. This is the way he's always acted. This is the way he is towards his people. What are you if you're a Christian? You're one who is saved, one who is rescued, and one who is loved freely by 
your Father in heaven. It was true for Israel in the Old Testament, wasn't it? How do the Ten Commandments begin? Interestingly, they don't start off with a command. They start off like this. I am the Lord your God who did what? Who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. And then it says in Deuteronomy 7, why did, why did, why did he do that? The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. Because you were the least of all peoples. But because the Lord loves you. And because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery. Why did he, why did he save Israel? Why did he love them? He loved them because he loved them. He chose them. They were helpless, they were in great darkness, and the Lord brought them out. And this was true in Israel's history, it was then true later on. There's that time when they had sinned, and they're being oppressed, and Gideon. The Lord brought about a deliverance. After darkness, light. There's that time in Esther's time. Looks like they're going to be killed en masse. Great darkness, helplessness, and then great light. The Lord brought about a great deliverance. It's true in your life, if you're a believer. You were once dead, enslaved, lost in sin, you were uh, an enemy of God, you didn't like him, you didn't love him, and then the Lord brought you into his marvellous light. He opened your eyes, he raised you from the dead, he freed you, he reconciled you. I was at a conference last week in Aberystwyth, and the, one of the preachers used an illustration of, that we're not simply drowning before the Lord comes to us, but we're decomposing at the bottom of the ocean. In other words, we needed more than just somebody throwing us a lifeline to help us. We needed resurrection spiritually. That's what the Lord did if you're a Christian. And if you're a believer, you've seen something that no one else has seen apart from other believers. It's not just a matter of knowing data about the Lord Jesus. But when you became a Christian, this is how the Lord rescued you. He rescued you by opening your eyes and showing you his glory. Imagine a, a fisherman who, he fishes near the coast and he catches herring, he catches other small fish, gets a few crabs. If he's having a really good day, he picks up a lobster or two. And that's what he does. He just goes through life pottering his way through life, earning a living, and he's kind of content in that. I think, well, that's life. And then one day he's out on the boat, and he sees a shadow in the water. Looks again. There's a shadow under the water he can faintly making out. It's, a, it's something, it's a creature so big that it changes his whole way of thinking about the ocean. He'd heard stories of these kind of monsters, and now he realised there's bigger things out there. There's bigger game than he ever realised. And he spends the rest of his life searching the ocean just to catch a glimpse of that again, something that great. That's a bit li like what's happened to you if you're a Christian. You're carrying on with your life. You're living a life which in many ways looks like anyone else's. Eat, drink, sleep, get married, raise a family and so forth. And then one day, you saw something, and that changed your life. And you realised this one thing, one thing I have desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What was it? You saw something that other people hadn't seen. You were captivated by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord has done great things for you. What is that great thing he has done? Not simply that he rescued you from sin, but he showed you himself. And that's the first certainty in this psalm. The Lord has done great things for us, if you're a believer. But maybe this is a bit of a foreign language to you. And you look at verse 2 and you think, well, 
these people seem to be in a kind of almost ecstatic state. They're, they're dreaming, verse 1. Their mouth is filled with laughter and singing. And, okay, it's okay to have something which you, you really enjoy, but are, are they going over the top? Or perhaps you could say, I don't know anything of this in my own experience. The Lord has done great things. Okay, so there's this, I get it in theory, Jesus died on the cross, and because he paid for sins, that means that I can be forgiven. I, I get the logic, but... <sighs> I'm not attracted by that. I, can't, I don't feel compelled to live my life on that. I kind of know it's true, and I don't want to go to hell, but as for giving myself heart and soul to that for whole, my whole life, to pursue glory and honour and immortality... No, I'm not, I'm not there. Well, if you're not there, it's good that you can recognise that. It's better to be hot or cold, not to be pretending in the lukewarm state. Because if you're cold, and you know you're cold, then you're in a position where you can look to the Lord for the Lord to do great things for you. This is what you need to see. I want you to imagine a, a river, and along this river are many, many factories. And this river is really disgusting because all these factories are, are emptying all their industrial waste into it. And so the fish in the river are, are, uh, are sticking out with the fit, they're sort of floating dead. There's old wheelie bins and trolleys and plastic bags and all sorts in that river. And you, you don't really want to touch it, but you're just doing an experiment and you, you, you put your hand and it's, it's like this thick, black, gloopy stuff. That's, that's disgusting. So you, you walk past those factories, you follow it upstream. And then the strange thing is, as you go upstream, it's, it doesn't improve. So all that factory and all, that, all the city life is all downstream, and yet as you follow up closer and closer to the source, it's still bad. And finally you get up there, you're up high in the hill country, and there's this little hole in the hillside, and it's just coming out black and gloopy and thick. What was the problem with that river? Was it the factories? Partly, they weren't helping, were they? But what was the fundamental problem with that river? It wasn't the factories. Do you know, there are many things that have probably happened in your life that aren't your fault. There are many things that happen to us that we have no control over. You can't choose where you're born. You can't choose who your family is. You can't, uh, as a child or as a young person, you may have been the receiving end of various kinds of injustice and even abuse, and maybe even as an adult. And there are many circumstances who are, which are outside of our control. And they make life hard. And sometimes there are people who have had their lives really messed up, and you can feel for them. You can see, well, you, 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 really, uh, you really had a rough deal, so to speak. But do you know the real problem with me, the real problem with you, if I can say it, is not any other factor in life. My biggest problem's me. Your biggest problem in your whole life is not any one individual thing, it's right up there at the source. I'm the problem. You're the problem in your life. And do you know, the Bible describes the heart of man as desperately wicked or incurably sick. You can try all sorts of things to improve and clean it up. You can get rid of all the factories. The river is still black and dirty. And this is why Christians rejoice and praise the Lord Jesus, because in him impossible things happen. The Lord does great things. That's what he's done in the gospel. He has made us glad why? Because he can change the river. The word that theologians use is regeneration. What does that mean? It simply means this, new life where there was complete death before. It means a new heart. It means new loves. It means a new creation. That you, there's something that God does in you so that you are genuinely a new person. That you have a you're born again, as Jesus described. 
Jesus suffered the just for the unjust to bring us to God. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. He gave the Holy Spirit. He's done great things for us. And we are glad as his people. That's the first certainty of the Christian life. Past deliverance. Verse 4. In fact, verse 3 again. The Lord has done great things for us, whereof we are glad. Verse 4. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Do you see how, there's, how this psalm turns on a hinge? Well, there's, there's this joy and laughter and rejoicing, and suddenly, you think, well, which is it? Are you, are you happy, <laughs> or are you down in the dumps? There's a shift in gear. gear. It goes from praise to pleading. There's a second certainty in the Christian life. You will experience this. The certainty of present longing and pain. Something changed. In the summer, some, some people enjoy going for a walk in the, up, say, in the Peak District or the Lake District, somewhere like that. You walk up a mountain and you start off in the sun and you're with the people you love and it's wonderful. And then, as you, when then suddenly the rain comes in, you're with the same people, you're doing exactly the same thing and then it's it's measurable. And you think, but, but I'm with the same people. Maybe your experience of coming to Melbourne Hall has been like that sometimes. You might have been here for a short time or many, many years. But if we're honest, it's like that. You look at the past and you say, yeah, that was wonderful then, that service, that season. And I was really enjoying the Word of God. I really felt blessed. I was encouraged. And now, now I'm with the same people. I'm in the same place. Something's changed. What's the problem? And then verses 5 and 6, what's happening? Twice we have weeping. They that sow in tears. Verse 6, he that goes forth and weepeth. What things make us weep? There are all sorts of things that make us weep. It might be that your, your own sin or the sin of other believers. It could be that you have unconverted children. Children who maybe grew up in church and they're not interested. It could be that there are situations where it looks like the devil has come in and won a victory. Maybe he looks, looks, looks like he destroyed a family or somebody you loved walked away from the Lord and you, that doesn't make sense to me. Lord? It could be that for some reason that you don't really understand. You're just in heaviness and dullness. And you've got all the books and all the doctrine and you've got plenty of experience as a Christian and yet, I just don't feel right. I feel like I'm wandering in the darkness. I want this to end. And so verse 4, he says, Turn again, turn again, our captivity, O Lord. Help us again. Restore our fortunes. Do something again. And on what basis do you pray such a prayer? Well, it's because the Lord has done these great things in the past, we have a basis to ask him to do them again. There's a real sense in which God is unknown. He is far beyond us. He is great. There are things about God which we will perhaps never know. But then there's a real sense in which God is known. We know who he is. We know his character. We've seen what he's done, even in our own lives and in the pages of church history, in the pages of scripture. We see the kind of God he is. He is the God who loves, delivers, and saves. And so on the basis of past mercies, we plead with him for fresh ones. And note what in particular he asks for. Look how he phrases it. He doesn't simply say, help us, or turn again our captivity, but he says this, at the end of verse 4, as the streams in the south, or literally as the streams in the Negev. Where's the Negev? It's a hot, dry region in the southern part of Israel. He talks about streams. You may have seen this kind of thing if you've ever watched uh, kind of wildlife documentaries where there's a very dry place and there are these empty gullies, empty riverbeds, and it all looks parched and there's nothing happening. And then, really quite quickly, it's all dry, and then the rain comes. 
and they fill up and there's new life. There's something that was a, a step change from what was there before. So when we're asking God to help us, what are we asking for? Well, we're not asking for a trickle. We're not asking, Lord, just help us to just get by. Help us to soldier on for the next 10 years. Lord, we, we do, we're just on survival mode. No. What are we praying for? We're praying because God is a big God and a great God. There's something that you may remember Mr. Bassett used to say. He used to say it more than once. What was it he used to say? You're coming to a king, large petitions with you bring, for his grace and power as such, none can ever ask too much. What are we asking from the Lord? We're asking, restore our fortunes, turn our captivity, help us, not in a general way, not in a vague way, but in this way in particular, like streams in the south. The Lord is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or imagine. So this psalm gives us scriptural grounds, a reason given by God himself to guide us in our prayers to pray for big things and to persist in praying for big things. Charles Spurgeon, a preacher, Baptist preacher in the 1800s, he said, do not let us forget the past, but in the presence of our present difficulty, let us resort unto the Lord and beseech him, beg him, to do that for us which we cannot possibly do for ourselves, that which no other power can perform on our behalf. What are you asking God for? Do you have a, a kind of a moping, mumbling sort of prayer life? Sometimes we do, don't we? And it's because we've lost sight of the greatness of God. God's power is like, you know those massive uh, dams they have where all the water is hidden behind them? It's all there. And if the gate is opened, then mighty power can come gushing forth. God is sovereign. We cannot force his hand, but God can open the gate. God can send out a great gushing flood any time he wants to, at the time where it least looks likely. So what must we do? Well, these words from the book of Isaiah. For Zion's sake, for the people of God's sake, do not hold your peace. For Jerusalem's sake, do not rest. Give him no rest until he establishes, until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth, until the unbelieving world once again says, the Lord's done great things for them. And that can happen in our day, that can happen in the UK, that can happen in your lifetime. What does God want us to do then? Well, he wants us to do this. He wants us to be men and women who pray. Make this a part of your regular prayer life. Praying for the Lord to send big blessings. Don't just pray for your daily bread and the needs that are of the particular things that you need in your life. Pray for those things. Absolutely. But pray this as well. Lord, for the glory of your name and for the good of your people, restore our fortunes, bring back our captivity like streams in the south. And then, verses 5 and 6, there's a third certainty. There's past deliverance, there's present pain and longing, but wonderfully, there's the certainty, verses 5 and 6, of future joy. We are thinking about joy last Sunday morning, and here's joy again. God's word is very balanced, and... We're not just called to have prayer meetings to ask God for revival, to ask God to do great things. We should ask God to do great things. But also, as we do that, we're then called to get on with all those things that the Lord wants us to do. So we pray, but then also we carry on, and we work, we serve, we labour. This verse talks about sowing. Sowing is not just people who stand in pulpits preaching. That's part of sowing. 
But whatever it is that God has called you to do in the particular life, the particular situation you are, the things that you do for the glory of God, which is whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, the things that in your life you do for the glory of God, that's a kind of sowing. And it doesn't seem to be lead, leading anywhere sometimes, but what does it say? Verse 6, He that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, seed, shall doubtless, certainly, definitely, come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. John chapter 12 and verse 24, Jesus, he's talking here about uh, this is a great principle of how the Christian life works, and also it was him himself who showed this most clearly. He said this, John 12, 24, Verily, verily, I say to you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. You're pouring your life out. You are saying, no, you are dying to self and living to God by the power of the Spirit. And we are tempted to fall into a kind of sense of, this is futile, nothing's happening. Jesus says, if the grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it will bring forth much fruit. Jesus says that. He went to the cross. He went to darkness. He was not yet in the place where he could see it with his own eyes. He could feel it in himself. But he went in faith, knowing that there was joy set before him. His life was sown. He died. That's the pattern for you and I. Because if we sow in tears, what will happen? We will reap in joy. I want to see in verse 6 that this, there's something individual here. So there's this general scene that we can think in our minds of the great day of judgment when everybody's there, where all, everybody stands before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't know exactly how that's going to look, of course. But there's this great day of judgment. There's the sheep and the goats. There's eternal glory. There's eternal misery. It's a great day. It's a great and terrible day. Now, the Apostle Paul, he's looking forward to the day of the Lord. And why is he looking forward to it? What is it particularly that he hopes to see? He's living his life of labour and he's serving the Lord. He is suffering in a way that most of us will never suffer. What is he looking for? There's these amazing words in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 17 to 20. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. He doesn't simply say, I'm looking forward to seeing Jesus. Now, no doubt he is. But he says this, Brethren, being taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavoured the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. For we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, our, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Why are we doing what we are doing? It's because we love each other. It's because souls are precious. As we heard this morning, the souls of men and women are precious. Why are we living this way as Christians? What is it for? It's because one day we have hope that we will see people we have loved on earth, safe, secure, happy, holy, righteous in heaven. That's why we do it. Jesus Christ is rejoicing in glory because of his people. The more you become like Jesus Christ, you share his joy. You enter into the joy of the Lord. What's that joy? That you will see the people on earth that you laboured and sowed and loved. Now this isn't a promise that every last person that you could ever pray for would definitely be saved. There's a mystery. But this is a promise 
that on that day you will stand there and you will be completely satisfied, you will be filled with joy, you will be absolutely certain that God is good, that God has done all things well, and that your life was not thrown away, that if anything, you wish you would have given more. Maybe that random person who you had for dinner once after a Sunday and you never saw them again, and you wonder what became of them, and they, 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 you maybe didn't share many things with them, but you showed them hospitality, you sowed, you did something in the name of the Lord. And there, on that day, you realise, it's you! Maybe a son or a daughter who you loved for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and they're there. You didn't throw your life away. It was worth it. There was a preacher in the 1700s called William Grimshaw. He's a character. He's worth reading about. He had a son called John. And John Grimshaw was a grief to his father. And on his deathbed, this preacher told his son John to take care of what he did. Why? Because he wasn't fit to die. Do you imagine that? There's, there's the father, he's on the deathbed, and he has a son beloved son. He's not, he's not ready to die. And he dies without knowing what becomes of his son. And before his death, John Grimshaw, he, there was evidence he really repented and found peace. He found pardon through Christ. And John Grimshaw said this, what will my old father say when he sees I've got to heaven? What I'm trying to say is, when you serve the Lord, not a tear is wasted. When you serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect master and commander, nothing can go wrong, ultimately, when he's in control. Everything that has been spoiled and ruined by Satan, the Lord Jesus, will make all things new. And the particular labour of your life, you will see. Joy. He that goes forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. So we've got past deliverance. We've got present longing. And we have certain future joy. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you praise for the Lord Jesus Christ, the example he set us. Make every one of us faithful to him that we may one day share his joy in seeing your people glorified. We pray in his name. Amen. Number 801, he gives more grace. We're thinking about labour, we're thinking about working for the Lord, our labour not being in vain. What, what will encourage us? 801. He gives more grace when the burdens go greater. He sends more strength when the labours increase.
Thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. Amen. <laughs>